Luke chapter 2, and we'll read the first 20 verses. This wonderful event, the incarnation of the Son of God, our Savior. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, And on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger, And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, as it was told unto them." Thus far we read the sacred account, the incarnation of our Lord in the worship of the angels and of shepherds. I want to consider this morning for a few moments the phrase at the end of verse 7, Luke 2, verse 7, having to do with why Jesus was laid in a manger And the answer is because there was no room for them in the inn. So no room. No room for Joseph and Mary, for them in the inn. No room for Jesus, the son of Mary, the son of God. No room for them in the inn. Now the inn would have been where... Many people would stay at that time, a rather rustic affair, just maybe on the outskirts of Bethlehem, just about one inn, that would all there be. There's not all kinds of inns and hotels as there was, there is today. It'd be an inn for caravans and their cattle, for there would be stables right next to the inn, even adjacent to them. And so the people would sleep in one room, maybe a common room, maybe certain guest rooms, and the cows and the donkeys in another, and the sheep. So that's where they go. But they go and they find there's no room in the ordinary inn, and we find them in a stable and laying Jesus in the manger when he's born. And it could have been that this was the stable of the inn, or maybe it was a grotto, 
a certain cave or so on where other animals would be kept by different pilgrims as they're on their way to Jerusalem or so on, which is Jerusalem's only six miles from Bethlehem. Uh, we don't know, know exactly just where Jesus was born, where Joseph and Mary had to go, but there was no room for them, no place for them, literally, in the inn. Now, this all <clears throat> might be very normal. We don't know exactly how long Joseph and Mary were <clears throat> in Bethlehem to be rejected by the innkeeper or told that there's just no room. Um, <clears throat> but it would have been understandable, even though they were given to hospitality in those days, much more than we are, I think. The Jews were known for their hospitality. And certainly with a woman and child, you'd think that they'd, they'd make room for them somewhere. Someone would say, oh, you can have my bed or something. But Again, it's understandable because it's a very busy time. Uh, it seems that there were others besides Joseph and Mary who were going to this Bethlehem, the house of their lineage, in order to be enrolled in the tax and the taxing that was going on according to the decree of Caesar, as we read in verse 1 of Luke 2. So much busyness, overcrowding, taxing on the mind, the minds of many, uh, involved maybe in once again in the, ke the question of this independence that they sought as Jews, free from Caesar and his taxing and his pesting them and badgering them and tyrannizing them. Maybe that's what they thought in their minds. And so they would notice hardly a humble carpenter and a young lass who is with child and they're poor and money talks, and maybe they would have noticed them if they had some shekels or some gold and silver, but apparently they had none. And maybe Joseph tried, and that's why they found that there was no room anywhere for them except in this lowly place with the cattle, this place of squalor and filth, and a manger, a feeding trough for the babe to be laid in. So normal, understandable in the busyness of life and at this time in Bethlehem, the first century A.D. And now, that phrase, it's somehow haunting to us, I think. No room for them in the inn. And maybe it was haunting to Mary, the fact that there was the room for them in the inn, because not long ago, remember, an angel had come to her and said, Mary, you're blessed of all women. You're going to have a child. His name will be Jesus, Jehovah's salvation. And he will be the son of the Most High, and he will be the Messiah. And more, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. This will be a miracle birth. Joseph won't know you until the child is born. And Mary had been denominated the most blessed of all women for that. And not only by Gabriel, but by cousin Elizabeth, who said she's the most blessed of all women, confirming the truth of the angel Gabriel. And all of these things, the, the thoughtful Mary, no doubt, was pondering in her heart, thinking about these things. And, and what a great privilege, indeed. And she had magnified the Lord with all her spirit and all her soul. She had been filled with joy not too long ago. And now here they are. And they're still lowly, and there's nothing great seems to be occurring here, according to the word of the angel and of Elizabeth and the leaping John. Nothing great, and it even seems incongruous. It doesn't fit that they don't fit. And I wonder if that's how we read this sometimes. It just doesn't fit. It can't be true. Here's the king of the universe. Here's the eternal son of God. And there's no room for it. Him and them, Joseph and Mary, in the inn. 
Most people follow this closely and with the idea that there is in this phrase, there's no room for them in the inn, a sort of prophecy. After all, it's part of the sign, part of the sign that the angels said would be confirming to the shepherds when they went to to Bethlehem. This shall be a sign to you, verse 12, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger, a sign. The sign, and I believe part of this, and this is how most commentators and preachers go, part of this was the no room in the inn, no vacancy, no place for Jesus. And certainly, it's true in accord with the rest of the scripture about Jesus. There'd be no place for Jesus anywhere in this world. He himself would say that the foxes have their holes and the rabbits and everybody else has a place. And the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. No place. No place in an inn, no place there. Soon it will be evident that there's not only ignorance with regard to this status of this wonderful child, but enmity, hostility. Not only we don't know, but we don't want. And so he's brought by Joseph and Mary to Egypt not long after this. And when it's found that there's going to be a problem in Herod's mind with one who was announced to be the king of the Jews, there's a competitor. So Jesus must go until that rascal dies and be in Egypt. No place for him in Israel. Just like John says in John 1, he came to his own. His own received him not. Don't you see how then this sign, this no room, no vacancy, is prophetic of all of Jesus' life? And there's more. When he would go back to Nazareth and he'd be now this public Jesus sometime later, they'd try to push him off a cliff. How much of a homecoming is that? When he announced that this day is this prophecy of Isaiah fulfilled in your ears and shut the book as if, yes, all eyes should be on him, they said, what pretension, what blasphemy of this son of Joseph, son of this poor Mary. How can that be? But, and that's why, no room for him in Nazareth. But back up a bit. Remember when Jesus was brought to Jerusalem and Joseph and Mary had been there and he was about 12 years old and the time when people come of age, confess their faith. Well, Jesus is found after three days, Mary and Joseph no doubt desperate, you know, the lost child. He's found in the temple answering and asking hard questions and confounding the Jewish leaders at his wisdom. And at that time, remember, Jesus really rebukes Joseph and Mary. Didn't you know I must be about my father's business? He seeks the fact that nobody was really minding the Father's business, certainly not like Jesus. And no one could get it. No room in their minds for that. A 12-year-old boy certainly couldn't be said of someone just by being born and in such squalor that he had a special concern to be about God's business. Well, on and on, his ministry showed it, didn't it? And children, you remember when he fed the 5,000 at Capernaum in John chapter 6? 
besides men and uh, women and children. And as he spoke to them after they'd received the, the loaves and been filled and the fish, and the more he spoke to them and identified himself as the bread of life, the one in the manger laid where cattle feed the bread of life. They couldn't take it. And then when he pressed the claim of himself that unless you eat and drink me, you shall perish, that they couldn't take. And then when he pressed the claim that I am the true manna, that they couldn't take. And all of his outward disciples, anyway, left him. John 6, the end of it. Talk about evacuating the church. Just preach Jesus. And his claims, separating the wheat from the chaff. And so they left him. And it wouldn't be long in his short life, public ministry, three years or so, and they would push him to the cross and crowd him out of their life forever, they hoped, killing him. This Jesus, no room. No room for them. No room for Joseph and Mary. And the prophecy is, it's because there's no room for Jesus. Now, is that any different today? Is it any different? It might seem like it. Uh, it's hard not to miss the, the celebration and the gladness that people have now that apparently our president had regained for them the right to say Merry Christmas. Put Christ back into Christmas. And you'd see as well the live nativity scenes, the celebration, as of old in the generations and much more so in America, of a Christian Christmas. Something that was decidedly about the gift, the reason for the season and all our giving. His gift to us. And it seems like it. Lots written about him. And you wonder, though, you wonder. Because it seems that people have a different conception of Jesus. Jesus, the babe, meek and mild, yes. Jesus, the little one. Jesus, the one who had lots to say of good. And with him, isn't it true? comes peace and there's goodwill toward men. It's amazing. This is what people latch on to. This prophesying of Jesus, this identity of Jesus, of this, this peacemaker, this, this man of peace, this lover of humanity, this evidence that there's still hope in all the world. And so it seems that the celebration of Jesus now is something that shows we've advanced. We've come a long way. The Jews rejected Jesus, but now maybe both Jews and maybe both Gentiles one day will finally admit, because we're more cultured now, that there's room for Jesus. There's room for him. And you find that too. You find that in religious universities of every stripe. There's room for Jesus in this room of the inn, this room of the university. The next room there's Confucius, in the next room there's Gandhi, in the next room there's Martin uh, Luther King Jr. And all around. Or maybe in the same room with Jesus, in the ends of these universities, sharing their thoughts and comparing notes, and we reading them all, disciples of them all. And among the liberal Christians, very liberal in the sense of those who really disregard 
the word of Jesus. There's a whole different conception of the true Jesus. The Jesus whose savior and whose judge. The Jesus of the cross, which was this definite, powerful atonement for sinners. The Jesus of heaven and hell. The Jesus who came not only to, no, let me put it this way, who came to establish peace, but this in the way of a great shakeup. A great shakeup. And to give spiritual blessings and not just health and wealth and earthly relationship. Now that Jesus doesn't seem to be welcome in anyone's inns, anyone's hearts. And so we could say there's a prophecy here, a sign here of the inn which is our hearts. And the innkeeper we know of humanity is the devil. And the devil has all kinds of occupants in his inn, say the world. And he won't let Jesus into this world if he can. And people themselves are glad for this innkeeper because Jesus is an inconvenience to them, really. Because he comes and, yes, he declares himself Savior, but what's this? He's also Lord. And this Jesus, therefore, he comes with this high blessedness of heaven and life with God. And people are saying, no, but I have no room in my life for that life and that Lord. I have a game room in my inn. And there's a great game room in the inn of the devil, this world. And I think its name is Hollywood. And there's no room for Jesus there. We don't want him there. Because you can't have Jesus in all the games people play if they're both your lords and they're both your happiness. They'll fit. They'll fit. No room. And the devil wants it that way, and sinners want it that way. No room. Jesus at our dining room, because, frankly, we don't need a blessing on our meal from Jesus. If he was such a great Savior that Christians make him out to be, well, there'd be just spiritual Stuff we'd get from him, but we're taking care of the earthly bread. Pass the bread, pass the wine, and I'll maybe pray to Jesus at church. You go through every room of the house of man, every room in our heart, and there's just no room for Jesus. That's the sinful heart, but that's our heart too. And that's why Christmas prophesies of a need, doesn't it? For you and for me. There's no, there's no room for Jesus in your heart. I say that to you. I say that to myself. This is our nature. Christ denying, Jesus denying sinners. He came to call them to repent and believe in him. We'll have none of it. We're too busy, aren't we? Too busy. Too busy. Too thinking about getting ahead to think about his humiliation and how that's going to be worth anything at the bank. We're too broken. 
to even have the faintest and wild ima wildest imagination that he could heal me in my marriage, my life. That's a pipe dream. So, no room for them in the end, for Jesus in the end. No room. The stock market, no room for Jesus. Maybe after the bell closing the day, but not while we're here making hay. No room. And all the culture, high culture is a low Jesus. One of the poets, one of the prophets, not the Savior, not the Lord, not the Son of God. So, why Christmas? That's the question I want to leave you with. And here's the answer from God's word. It came to pass in those days, God found room where there was no room. That's what Christmas is all about. We have lots of questions. How can God find room and dwell among us? How can he come in that way? Really? It's just not what the philosophers say. Spirit and word cannot dwell together. Spirit and flesh cannot dwell together. Can't be. Infinite and finite are two absolutely different, not only distinct, but different and unequal concepts and truths. You cannot put God into humanity or you have no God. Even the philosophers know that. If God's God, he's God. Above, just transcendent can't be imminent with us. But God makes the way, and not to please philosophers, but to confound them. And everything about the Christmas story is to confound the ones who have no room in their minds for thoughts divine, who in their logic start with man, start with what you see, start with maybe they're rising up to certain principles and ideas, platonic maybe, about what there might be and what there ought to be. But they cannot and will not start with a logos, the word of God. But fools, in the beginning was the word, the logos, the communication from heaven, and the word was with God and the word was God. And all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Here is the answer. In the sign of the manger and the no vacancy sign over the inn. God makes a way, but, or finds a way, but. It's even more wonderful than that. It's not that God in this fullness of time, having ached and longed for all kinds of centuries, finally found a way and discovered, ah, now maybe this will work. No. See that decree of Caesar? It's right at the head of this chapter, children. Luke 2, verse 1, it came to pass that there went out a decree from Caesar. Well, our God is the God of a decree, a sovereign plan, a council. And that's always and ever and eternally been Father, Son, and Holy Spirit counseling with regard to this event, this Christmas, this sign, this one who set for the rising and the falling of many. 
God knew this. He didn't just find a way. He had a way. And he prophesied of the way. And way back in Isaiah, he prophesied of the reality of the days that would come to pass according to the decree of God in the present tense. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Isaiah the prophet, long, long time before Jesus was laid in the manger. And God dwelt with sinners in him. God's decree, he makes his way. And heaven and earth themselves, he will move. That the way comes to pass. It's his way. It's his way. And you see, it's all because God would glorify himself. People forget that. Christmas is not about just presents to us or even a savior for us. Can I speak that way at the risk of being called, being called a, a Scrooge or whatever? Beloved, it's about God. The story here and the rejection of men is about God who would glorify his name. The angels would say, glory to God in the highest at this time. And this is what the message is. Glory to God. Not about you, God doing you favors. Not about the wicked and their rejecting God. It's all about that, of course, but ultimately and primarily it's about God getting the glory over Caesar, over all things, in your life, in my life, and so on. God making a way. You see, he will win. Love will win. This is love manifest when God sent his son. This will be love when God commends to our attention exhibit A of love, the cross of Calvary, and God sent in flesh to die for sinners and that they might live forever. Unconditional, free, generous God of heaven who bankrupts heaven as it were So that there's a way. And this is amazing because Jesus is that way. And as he's being brought forth and developing and so on, wonder of wonders, he's volunteering. You look at Philippians 2, a great chapter to read on Christmas Day. He, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, took on him the human nature and the servant, became in the likeness of men. It's all about his wanting to do this. The Son incarnate now a part of this, not just some kind of victim, but there he is, the king, in swaddling clothes laid in a manger to feed the sons of men. Beasts all by nature, but his. And, of course, we can't stop there, though we stop soon. Jesus <clears throat> is the reason why now our hearts have room for him. Because Jesus and God in Jesus revealed has found a way into our hearts, not just into this universe and into human society in general, but into hearts and into the inn of our heart and into every room of our life. He's done that. Because when he died, he rose again. And, and when he rose again, he ascended into heaven. And when he ascended into heaven, he's made Lord and he's made Christ. And he receives the Spirit of, of God. And the Spirit of God in Jesus is sent forth as the Spirit of Christ to apply the redemption that was accomplished. To, re, to, to apply that so that we are exalted. And now there's a place for Jesus in our heart. He makes 
room in the regenerating work of his spirit. That's true. We confess Jesus here. We confess that there's room now. That there's light in our life now. Because he's come in. He's made a way. We would have bullied him out of existence. No room in our playground. He says, I'm playing. No room in our work. He says, I'm there. Your boss, your co-worker, he's there. No room. We're so busy. He says, I'm going to show you what it is to wait on me. He's done this. Done this. Oh, amazing. You know that, don't you, beloved? That's why we're happy today. That's why we rejoice today. We say Merry Christmas or Blessed Christmas or Incarnation Day. I don't know about you, but I have trouble figuring out what to say on Christmas Day. Because Christmas is every day and all of this stuff, and the world has hijacked all of the phrases. And I want to stand out. But what matters is the heart, isn't it? Right. And every day. And Jesus has made our heart matter and our lives matter. Isn't that something? God with us loves you. Comes into your life. He's not this theory. He's yours. You're his. And though you don't feel like it, because there's all the rejecting still that goes on, our flesh, our private agendas, our desires that go against him still, nevertheless, he's having his way. Believe that. And all of our tendency to have this room, it's called, and maybe the center of the room, center of our in, our life, emotion, and how we can go up and down according as the stocks go up or down or people like us or not. And Jesus says, no. Now my word is the center of your life. And you're transformed by your mind, and you think about that, and so on. Now I love Jesus, and now there's room for me in all my busy life to go to church, be a church member, and to give to this family that's not just mine, it's his. So we're glad. But finally, beloved, know that <clears throat> when the world rejected Jesus in Bethlehem and when the world rejected Jesus now, rejects Jesus now, <clears throat> there was no room for Jesus then in the end and there's no room for him now. But even as there was no room for Jesus Associates, Joseph and Mary, no room for them who were with him in the end. So the case is, wherever Jesus has associates and friends and true Christians, we are identified with Jesus and Jesus with us, and there's no room for all of us in the world's ends. That's the cross we bear. You would go with Jesus to the inn. You would have Jesus in the inn of your heart and of your life. There's no room for people who are next to you for your Jesus who is in you and who is shining in your life. Be ready. Be ready, young people. No room for Jesus and therefore for you in this world and increasingly the church of Jesus Christ that's true, the Christians that are true, who, though they leave all or have all, nevertheless, for whom Jesus is all, they are cornered and they are, they are marginalized increasingly 
from society, from church society. Be ready. But beloved, it's not that we're up for it, God's up for it, because he's going to get the glory in us. So no room for Jesus in the end, no room for us in the end, but Jesus has made room. That's because he loves us, and praise be to God, and oh, come let us adore him. He loves us still. He loves us still, and he will love us forever. The beginning of this manifestation of God with us, the gospel promise now fulfilled, will have its ultimate, final fulfillment in heaven. In heaven. And there's only one in there, and all the doors are open, as it were. And Christ is in the center of the house, the new Jerusalem. And we with him, and he with us, and God be praised forever. Now that's Christmas. Make it yours. Amen. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We need to remember the word of God, Lord, the joy of Christmas, the reality of you who have found the way, you who are the way in and we pray, Lord, that you would bless us and continue to bless us this day and this week until you call us once again to worship you together. May we be kept from the world, outstanding in the world, the light of the world. For Jesus' sake, amen.